Welcome to the Hermetic Astrology Podcast. I'm Gary Caton in Waynesville, North Carolina. You can find me on the web at dreamastrologer.com. And today is Saturday, June 26, 2021. It is Saturn's day, Saturn's hour. And Saturn is at the lower angle right now, moving, applying to the lower angle, what we would call anti-culminating. And so these three things together, the day and hour of the planet, uh, Saturn is in Aquarius, one of its dignities, and Saturn is angular. <clears throat> these three things together would be the minimum to do Saturn magic. Uh, however, Saturn is also retrograde and uh, receiving an opposition and applying opposition from Mars who is perfecting the, uh, the uh, Saturn-Uranus square into a T-square at the moment. So, oh, I forgot to mention the moon is also applying to Saturn. So those four things, Saturn day and hour, Saturn in its dignity, Saturn angular with the moon applying to Saturn. This, is, this would be great for doing uh, Saturn's magic. However, with Mars involved, we definitely don't want to mess with that. That being said, Mars will naturally increase our conscious awareness of this Saturn Uranus square that's been going on for a little while now. So it's a perfect time for um, contemplation of Saturn, particularly the Saturn Uranus square. Um, that's one of the things that I tell my people in, in the magic report that I send out every, not all magical moments are created equal, equally. We, we certainly wouldn't want to um, create a permanent, you know, carved in stone talisman of, you know, every single moment that we, that we have in these lecture reports. That being said, sometimes doing a petition or even just contemplation, as we're going to do today, is a very worthwhile endeavor and very magical in the sense of the more consciousness that you have around something, the more choices you have, generally speaking. And the more choices you have, the more effective your actions become. And the more effective your actions become, you know, the more magical and the more powerful that... Um, your life becomes, you see. So um, this is a good time for us to, to talk about Saturn at the very, and think about Saturn at the very least. And I've been wanting to do this for a little while, but you know, life happens and so on and so forth. Um, but these, these Saturn Uranus squares are very important and, and it's important to distinguish um, the different kinds of squares as well. Um, so I wanna get into some of the technical details, but, but let's just start off talking about uh, some of the basics, right? So Saturn is the furthest planet that's visible to the, the furthest planets visible to the naked eye. Um, and so Saturn represents the furthest reaches of our system as we know it, as we can perceive it with our natural God-given senses. Um, and so Saturn naturally rules over structures, boundaries, structures, structures, boundaries, limits. Um, Saturn is associated with authority, uh, tradition, habit, um, patterns, these kinds of things. Um, now, Uranus is very different. Uranus was the first planet to be uh, discovered by way of telescope. So Uranus represents. Now, that being said, now that we know where Uranus is, under the very best of circumstances, if we know just where and when to look, you can see Saturn with the naked eye. So it's so Saturn. So, geez. I'm getting all uh, mixed up today. Uranus represents um, that which you can just barely perceive if 
you know, just when, where, and how to look. So it's kind of like this insider information in a way that is um, very technically uh, and technologically um, dependent. Uh, and so in this day and age, there's a lot of that, right? Um, since Uranus became discovered, the, the massive amounts of technological change that have happened in our world are, are, it's really, I think it's very difficult for us to fathom as modern people, how extremely different our world is from the world that human beings inhabited for a few thousand years, um, and, and much less the, the world that human beings inhabited before pre-civilization, you know, um, those three things are all very different. Um, and so, so Uranus represents number one technology. In my book, it is the planet of modern technology. So it also represents innovation. Um, in general, the incorporation of new ideas. Now we were incorporating new ideas for a long time before Uranus came along. So not just new ideas in general, but the incorporation of new technology and the incorporation of the um, new ideas that technology makes possible, you see. Um, so it represents creative opportunities, but also destructive potentials, because as I mentioned before, I think last time, you know, there is often a dark side to uh, technological advances that we don't really wanna see. Um, this doesn't always, this isn't always inherent in the technology itself. You know, uh, for instance, Eli Whitney's cotton gin did not in and of itself present any kind of um, toxic or um, um, byproducts that were worrisome but it did allow for um, the evil of slavery to become more entrenched in society because it made it made cotton that much more valuable and uh, and necessary. And the economy around cotton had already begun to be um, uh, associated with slave labor. And so, even when the technology isn't isn't necessarily um, has a, has a necessarily a dark side in and of itself, the way we use the technology often does. You see, um, and in the case of nuclear technology, very clearly inherently in the technology is a dark side that is a um, toxic, b dangerous. Uh, and beyond dangerous. Um, and, so, and so on the one hand, we have very much um, the opportunity for uh, game-changing creative opportunities, but also to watch out for the dark side of it. And so, so just like in the mythological, um, confrontation between these two gods, uh, Uranus was overthrown by Saturn and in a bloody um, patricide, which is often the way that society changed for a long time. Um, and in the, you know, so-called enlightenment era, you know, we founded governments that were, were hopefully based on the peaceful exchange of power, which isn't always the case either. Um, but these two principles, Saturn and Uranus, are very opposite in nature. And so anytime you, you have them interacting, there's a possibility for a, um, for a harsh collision between things that don't really mix and they could blow up in your face. Um, so there's always that. <clears throat> Even, 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 when, even when you're doing everything right, you know, just a little bit off in the mixture, a little bit, things, things can get out of hand. So it's a very volatile mixture. It's, you know, as, every, as anyone who has eyes can, can see, to see, can look around and see, 
it's a dangerous time, you know? Um, and so we find ourselves, you know, a little bit on, on, on the eggshells, maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit um, uh, tentative about uh, uh, moving forward uh, naturally. I think, I think that shows good common sense. If you're feeling that uh, good instincts. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to be too cautious because if there are game changing opportunities to be had and we don't move on them, someone else will, and we'll get left behind. See? So it's, it's tough. You have to be open enough to, um, to know and embrace the future when it, when it, when it calls and you have to be solid and, um, and, and confident enough in your own structure and, and discipline to say, no, um, I know when to stop. I know when is enough as well. You know, the Tao talks about this kind of wisdom, knowing when is enough is very important and not, not exceeding the boundaries when, when it's not appropriate or safe to do so. Um, yeah, so this is interesting too, because, you know, if we look at Saturn in terms of the signs that it rules, Saturn rules Capricorn by night and Aquarius by day. Capricorn represents the closed boundaries, you know, in the, uh, in the ancient world where astrology, as we know it was formed, um, boundaries would have been the walls of the city state. And so then the opening in those walls would have been closed at night, the gate to the city would have been closed for safety. And likewise, modern people, most modern people, I didn't as a child, we never locked our door at night or ever. Um, and half the time the windows were wide open too. Uh, but we were poor, we didn't have anything <laughs> to steal. So it never occurred, you know. Um, you know, it's, there was, you know, if somebody wanted to come in, there was really nothing to take. So, you know, it wasn't a concern. Um, but nowadays, most people close and or lock their doors and windows at night. Whereas in the day, you might uh, open the windows and doors to allow air and people to come and go, you see. So there's this idea that healthy systems have semi-porous boundaries. They allow some things in. Um, they're not completely closed down, completely rigid, because that would be um, a death sentence, essentially. Um, but they also are not too open. They, they shut out most things um, and they allow a safe container for life to have some rhythm and some safety and security. Um, but, they, but they also allow interchange with the environment to take place so that things can keep growing. So some new input uh, and room for growth is necessary, but not so much that it destabilizes the entire system and becomes chaotic. You see, so this, so um, this dichotomy that we're talking about between Saturn and Uranus is naturally there and always has been there, um, but it's just the, that Uranus takes it to another level, you see. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's that Saturn represents, or one of the things that I talked about is um, authority and tradition. And so one thing I wanted to share with you is uh, one of my favorite authorities, uh, Alexander Ruperti, Cycles of Becoming is really the, um, the standard in, in, in my day and age as I was coming up understanding cycles. Um, People that I looked up to, Robert Blaschke and Michael Mancasey, you know, they, they looked up to this guy. He was a Rogerian. He was a student of Dane Rudger. Um, and 
I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what he says in his cycle of, or sorry, in his chapter about the Saturn Uranus cycle. Um, so this this is more of the sort of psychological, the the personal, uh, internal dynamic that would be uh, um, going on. He says. Um, if a crucial phase of the Saturn-Uranus cycle coincides with some overwhelming emotional crisis, the cause will always be the rigid inertia of social customs, privileges, personal habits, or assumed behavior patterns, which resist the call of the creative spirit within. So essentially what he's saying is that, hey, naturally we have these um, customs, privileges, habits, and behavior patterns. It's when they become over crystallized, over rigid, and, and we cling to them um, defensively that, um, that we, can't, we either can't hear or we can't respond to the creative call uh, to the creative spirit, right? And, uh, and now, you know, this, this could look like, um, you know, with that whole thing with the, with the millennials, you know, okay, boomer, you know, right? Like, it could look like that. Um, and it probably does look like that a lot to younger folks. However, at the same time, don't don't get confused because he goes on to say that um, he he does equivocate somewhat. And he says um, sorry, he says that um, one must also face the challenge to contribute wisely to this process of social change to avoid the twin evils of either a dependence on a return to the past, which we just talked to, clinging to the past, not always a good idea, or an over-radical transformation, which would destroy that part of the past, which is essential to the future, you see? So this reminds me very much of what Rujar said, in particular about the third quarter phase which is where we are in the Saturn-Uranus cycle, right? You have the conjunction, then you have the first quarter square, then you have the opposition, then you have the third quarter square. So if we use the solar cycle as, a, as an analogy, the conjunction would be the spring equinox, um, and then the first quarter square would be the solstice, right? The halfway point would be the fall, equinox and the third quarter square would be um sorry the the conjunction is the winter solstice the first quarter square is the, is the spring equinox where we are in the cycle now is the opposition the solstice third quarter square would be harvest time um fall when the leaves fall from the trees and, and the seed of the future falls from the trees at the same time that the, that the detritus of the old cycle is falling. So on the one hand, he says, be careful how you identify. If you identify with the past, Rujar says we have to choose the currents to which we are drawn. You can identify with the past, with the leaves that are falling and de decaying, or you can identify with the future, the seed potential of the future. Um, that said, it's very possible, yeah, that, you know, someone who, is, particularly someone who is older, might be clinging to old ways, overly so. Um, it's also equally possible that the young are a little too idealistically um, enamored of the future and go a little too far, a little too radical with trying to push what's possible and overstep what's really actually possible and, um, and throw the baby out with the bathwater because you can't recreate uh, the entire world from scratch. You're not God, 
right? We're, we're, we're God-like in some ways, but we're not gods. <clears throat> and so we have to carry some of the past with us. Just how much the ratio, it depends. It depends on personal preference. It depends on um, what we're trying to do. Um, and so there's this balance, just like we said, between uh, protection and openness. There's this balance between how much of the past do we carry forward and, and how much do we have to let go in order to let the future in. So it's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act. Um, and in particular, because right now we only have the seed of the future. <clears throat> we don't, we can't say for sure what that future is going to look like, you see? So we only have, we can only allow for the potential of the future, but we can't really put all of our eggs in one basket, as they say, because we don't know if that particular seed is going to be the one that takes hold and, and goes all the way, right? So we might need to spread we might need to hedge our bets a little bit, um, you know? And so we're gonna be talking about that uh, as an investment strategy and in investing in the future and so forth. Um, all right, so let's see if there's anything else that Mr. Ruperti has to say here that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, so he talks about the, you know, there's a breakdown of social, religious, and cultural forms or customs. And this results in the breakdown of the egos that are tied to those. Um, and, and that in, if they are unable to contain the energy of new creative forces, you know, they miss out on the future, essentially. So um, and it's what's really fascinating about this is that he says, he says on the next page, I'm on page 202, now I'm moving to page 203, he says, at the time of this writing, the waning square of this cycle has just passed. So Ruperti wrote this book um, at the time of a Uranus, or Saturn-Uranus waning square, um, like we're in now. So basically one Saturn-Uranus cycle ago, this book was written, which is interesting. Um, he says, the Uranus transformation of personal egos, social class identification, and habitual and heretofore presumed logical patterns of thought and action should produce a crisis in consciousness, right? Rudyard said the opening square was a crisis in action. Something had to be done to assure the viability of the organism. Whereas the third quarter square is a crisis in consciousness. The consciousness has to become aware of and make room for the seed of the future, right? Um, so the Uranus transformation of personal egos and social class identification, um, you know, in his time, you know, class was about as far as it went, you know, nowadays we have a whole lot of other categories that we could add to that and habitual and here to form presumed logical patterns of thought and action should produce a crisis in consciousness leading to a revision of values and motives. This is the time to correct past mistakes and focus on the future. Thus, one may be better prepared to meet the new creative forces which will be released at the conjunction, you see? So it's a time of preparation and, um, and of, opening to receive the seed of the future. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much where we're at. Thank you, Mr. Ruperti. Um, and I did a little bit of research on this that I wanna share with y'all because I wanted to, um, to talk about where we're at, but you know, one of the base, best ways to understand where you're at really is not to reject the future, or sorry, not to reject the future or the past, not to reject the past, but to actually understand it, 
before going forward to the future, you know? And so um, in that, in that, in, in that uh, light, I looked back at some of the um, previous Saturn Uranus cycles uh, from a mundane sense. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So if you're listening in on the audio version, this is where I invite you to join us on the uh, YouTube version of the podcast where you can see the visuals that I'm about to share. So here's the chart for the moment. You can see Saturn is moving towards the lower angle there. The moon's applying to Saturn. Saturn's in its dignity. Saturn day, Saturn hour, Saturn ruled sign on the ascendant. Moon applying to Saturn. It's really a great um, beginning to, but again, you know, with the uh, Saturn retrograde and Mars opposition and Uranus square. Yeah, yeah, we're not carving this in stone by any means, <laughs> but we can use it for some pretty good contemplation. And one of the things that I'd like to contemplate with you is um, the birth of the nation where I was born and which I call home. And yeah, I know, you know, it's, uh, it's American centric and yada, yada, but I don't live anywhere else. And I've never lived anywhere else. I've been other places, but I've never lived anywhere else. And so honestly, I think it would be a little disingenuous to do otherwise. Um, and so hopefully for you international listeners, uh, you know, you, maybe you can apply this uh, same process to your own country and see, you know, what's going on. But the USA, of course, was founded July 4th, 1776. I have come to the point where I'm using what's called a Surya Lagna, Surya being the name of the sun god in uh, Hindu or Vedic astrology. And so a sunrise chart, uh, sunrise is the breath, first breath of the day, just like uh, when I was born, I took my first breath, right? The first breath of the day is, is the birth of the day. So um, we can use that chart. There's, there's, there's really no reliable time for the, for the signing of the Declaration of the Independence on this day or a couple of days before. So it's just easier to, um, to use the sunrise chart. And we can see that Saturn and Uranus are in a trine relationship in air signs. They're making a trine in air signs. And so Uranus is at about nine degrees of Gemini. Saturn is almost 15 of Libra. So the fact that they are, are in aspect in the nativity tells us that these transits are going to be important to the development of this organism. Countries are organisms, whether or not corporations are is another uh, thing altogether. Um, but countries are definitely organisms that have a body and a consciousness and may maybe even a soul, uh, I would hope. <laughs> That's why I say maybe even, because there are times where you have to wonder. Um, so when we, when we then look at um, where did this cycle originate, what we see is that uh, there was a Saturn-Uranus conjunction prior to this that happened in the sign of Aries. Um, and so this is a fire sign and it's, a, and it's the first sign of the zodiac. And in this Surya Lagna chart, Aries is the 10th sign from Cancer. So it's the 10th house. Um, and so the house of uh, government and authority and so forth. It's very interesting, right? That Saturn and Uranus, the seed moment of this cycle was in Aries and that, and that this nation was born as a Cancer nation because um, this, this whole tension between the, the, the uh, you know, the tyranny of the king and the desire to create a new um, 
system independent of all that baggage, you know, the very Saturn Uranus. Um, and so, of course, the Saturn Uranus trine shows up in the natal chart. And of course, the Saturn Uranus conjunction upon which this trine is building shows up prominently in the, um, in the nativity, right? And uh, yeah, so, and, 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 and it's almost like, um, you know, you know, through, we became the, uh, that which we tried to overthrow, right? Um, which is very typical of human nature and human development. Um, and also because of this, you know, Aries um, seed energy, um, when we get to the third quarter square of, the, of this particular cycle, um, the opposition the opposition happened in 1782 and then the third quarter square in 1794 and this this is in fact when Eli Whitney was granted the cotton for the, the patent for the first cotton gin, uh, which means cotton engine. Essentially, it was a way to mechanically separate the fibers from the seeds. And um, it revolutionized the cotton industry, but it also led to the growth of slavery. <clears throat> and so that whole contradiction that was um, embedded in the US Constitution um, became more embedded and the seed of the future was planted with the evil of the past. Too much of the evil of the past was carried forward in this case, you see. Um, and, there, and, and there were consequences for that. Um, another thing that was happening at this time, which is very interesting, and speaks very much to the nature of the waning square in terms of the ancient dynamics of aspects. Um, and I'll, I'll show you more about that in just a second. Um, in the first half of the, I'll just go ahead and speak to that. In the first half of the cycle, as, the, as Saturn is moving out away from uh, Uranus in zodiacal motion, right? Saturn reaches 90 degrees from Uranus in zodiacal motion. In diurnal motion, as they're rotating around the heavens, that means Uranus rises first. And this is true of all cycles. The slower planet in the, dominates the first half of the cycle because although the, and, and think of it, it's like the young seedling is just, is, is going out and it's, it's not strong enough yet. It, it may not even survive this first quarter square. Um, because Uranus, the slower planet is dominating. The slower planet is reaching the uh, ascendant first. And by the time that the, that, the, that, the, uh, that the faster planet begins to rise, the slower planet is dominating the heavens. It's at the, it's at, it's at the, um, uh, it's at the mid heaven. Yeah, it's at, it's at the MC. As the, slow, as the faster planet is rising, the slower planet has already, it's, it's got the high ground, right? So the slower planet dominates the opening square and the faster planet has to overcome that enough to have its own autonomy and individuality. Then at the opposition, there's this kind of tension between them. There's this, hopefully this flowering or this culmination of the growth cycle. And then at the third quarter square, now the faster planet is dominating this square. The faster planet at this point is at the midheaven as the slower planet rises. So the faster planet dominates the second half of the cycle. And in this case, it's Saturn. So Saturn dominates the, the, the third quarter square which is interesting because if you think about it, you know, 
Saturn would be the government and Uranus would be the rebels, essentially. And, and at this point in 1794, there was a very famous um, episode in, in American history that's called the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, it was an uprising against the imposition of a liquor tax. Um, it was the very first tax on a domestic product by the newly formed federal government. Um, they needed to pay off their war debt for the Revolutionary War. And, uh, and, and what's, re what's really interesting about this is that taxation was a fundamental issue of the revolution, right? They, they, they said, hey, no taxation without representation. Y'all, y'all, we don't have representation in y'all's laws, in y'all's assemblies, blah, blah, blah. We're not going, you, you, we're not paying your taxes if we don't have representation, right? So, and then they turn around and say, okay, now we're gonna tax you guys. <laughs> and they, I don't think so. They, you know, the settlers tarred and feathered these cats when they came around to, to, to collect the taxes. <laughs> Pretty redneck, you know. Um, but pretty understandable too because you know hey this is we we already we just fought a war about this what are you talking about you're gonna come around here and tax us you know and you got to understand you know as a farmer when you have surplus grain trying to carry that forward is is a very difficult proposition you you know you, you got pests you got mold you got all kinds of things that might destroy that before you can keep it safely until it's usable it might, you know, and so what they would do is they would, um, they would first ferment and then distill that fermentation of the grain. And so essentially the liquor became a way to store the value. It was a kind of currency, in fact. Um, and it was a way to store the surplus of their uh, crops in, in a portable, and, and uh, form that would that would keep, um, and that was valuable. Um, and so, when you know when the government started trying to tax them, they were like, "I don't think so, man." You know, and and Washington General George Washington, who was now President George Washington, called up thirteen thousand militias, <laughs> and the rebels went home wisely. Uh, and, and wisely, all of those who were arrested were either acquitted or pardoned. So, yeah, we kind of got out of that without any real repercussions. Um, and, but it made real the idea, right? There was this idea that the government could use, could A, impose taxes, B, that it could use force to suppress resistance to its laws. Um, this idea now was reality. Washington, it was only an idea until Washington made it real by calling up those troops, you see. And this also, very interestingly, one of the, um, one of the byproducts of this was that it contributed very much to the growing uh, separation of and growth of political parties, right? Because now, you, you had these two camps that were very, this tension between the federal government and the, the individual interests. This is where it all started um, because you had the federalists and the anti-federalists, right? And um, the federalists wanted a strong federal government, wanted a strong federal presence. You know, they essentially wanted to become a player on the world stage. And the anti-federalists were like, hey, look, this all started as a collection of friends, you know, as a, as a group of states that banded together mutual friendship. You know, the um, Articles of the Confederation were, you know, essentially just an agreement amongst 13 states to just get along and have each other's backs. There was no federal authority at first. Um, and so there was a lot of people that said, hey, that's, that's pretty well good enough. We don't, we don't want or need a federal authority, um, but now we've got one and it works so far <clears throat> to the extent that it could impose these taxes, 
without becoming tyrannical about it <clears throat> so far. Um, but you start to see there's this very strong division that's starting to form around these different political ideas. You might say uh, conservative versus progressive even was already beginning here. Now the next conjunction happens in 1805, which is just after the um, Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon had to sell France's interest in their uh, colonial holdings um, to the United States in order to finance his war. And so there was the Louisiana Purchase, which became the Louisiana Territory in 1805. And so I think it was Jefferson at this point who was president said, hey, you know, we need to find out what's out there. We need to see where is the future of this country? What, what does that look like? Um, and so he sent uh, Meriwether Lewis and, or, or uh, Lewis and Clark um, out into this new territory to, to see what was going on. Um, and so this was, this is interesting because it, from, from cancer, this uh, conjunction happens in the fourth house of home of, and also like real estate. Like there was a dramatic increase in the amount of real estate that was, you know, pretty much doubled the size, if not more, of the country with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and so we have this radical new vision of the future, which included things like what became to be known as Manifest Destiny. Oh, it's our God-given right to march across this country, which, you know, Bob Dylan wrote a song about that with God on our side. You know, when you got God on your side, it's like you got to be careful because people assume all kinds of things to be true that are uh, unthinkable even without that notion. So, yeah, when we look, what's interesting is when we look forward to, um, you know, and it's interesting, you know, in the previous cycle under which this was born, the seed moment was in Aries. Saturn isn't all that um, powerful in Aries. And so the Iranian forces kind of had the upper hand in that cycle. This cycle has begun in Saturn's exaltation. And what's interesting about that is that um, when we look to the third quarter square in this cycle, it's a little bit different. Um, the, you can see even more the conservative kind of, uh, States' rights uh, in, in, in 1839 and 1840, um, uh, Tyler became the first vice president to succeed to the presidency without being elected. Um, and he was a staunch states' rights act, act advocate and a strong believer in manifest destiny, which led to the annexation of Texas. So once again, you see this um, increase in the size of the territory and this idea of manifest destiny, um, which was very problematic in many ways uh, for a lot of people. <clears throat> All right, and if we look forward to the next conjunction. So once again, we see the forces of Saturn kind of having the upper hand at this waning square. All right, and um, if we look forward to the next conjunction, this one happened in Oh, sorry, that's the next square. 1840, we want the next conjunction. The next one happened in Taurus. Now, um, this is very interesting because this is the 11th house from Cancer. So 
it has a very um, social focus groups and so forth, but uh, groups imply both, you know, inclusion and exclusion. And so um, the, the, the people that were excluded, the Americans that were excluded from uh, full or even partial really um, inclusion, notably the African-Americans, um, this became much more of an issue under this cycle. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published at this time and Frederick Douglass gave a very famous speech this year in 1852 uh, on the July 5th saying, you know, hey, we, while you're celebrating your national holiday, this is like the worst day of the year because, you know, this is like our oppressors, you know, all celebrating, you know, um, at our expense, you know. And so um, this was the cycle wherein that hypocrisy and um, of, of, you know, the founding ideals not really being uh, practiced becomes to the fore. Um, and, you know, we had the Civil War not long after this. Um, and if we look forward to the waning square, it's interesting because you can really begin to see at this point, we're not far from the, uh, we're not far really from, you know, the truly modern stuff beginning to show up. Um, and so when we look to the third quarter square, we see some interesting developments. Um, the third quarter square happened in 1885, which some notable developments are the first skyscraper was built at this time. And the, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was first published. So this is very interesting. Remember, this started in Taurus. So buildings, and also um, economic interests, right, are associated with Taurus. And so you, you have both of these things, the seeds of the future are showing up here at the end of the cycle. Um, and then when we go forward to the next conjunction, this one is very interesting because this one um, is really just prior to the 20th century. Um, and it's in Scorpio. Um, and so there's a, there's a, there's a Neptune-Pluto conjunction happening in Gemini at the same time, which was also a very big long-term cycle. So you had a couple different cycles happening together at this time. And this is, this is when a lot of what the 20th century was built on comes into being. Um, and this is very interesting because um, when you look at this one and, and, and when you look at um, the Saturn-Uranus cycle in general, the Saturn-Uranus cycle, I haven't quantified this yet, but it's about 45 and a half years. Well, this is very interesting because if you know anything at all about synodic cycles, um, 45 and a half years is just a half year shy of 46 and 46 is a major synodic return for mercury 46 is the is the most precise synodic return at 46 years old mercury will will return to with its most precision to the same point as it was in your natal chart on your birthday at 46 years old right so there's a nearly exact return of mercury to all its placements after 46 years so essentially what I'm saying is that this cycle corresponds to a Mercury elemental year return. Now, because it's a half a year difference, it doesn't, it's not long-term. In other words, not every Saturn-Uranus cycle will be in the same Mercury elemental year, but there will be strings of Mercury elemental years that will come together in the same element and then it'll move on. It'll, it'll, so basically, this was the first of three conjunctions 
of Saturn Uranus that happen during Mercury elemental years of air. This is very fascinating to me because water, in terms of the four elements, is very simple. Even a child understands that when you throw a rock into water, it sinks. Therefore, Earth is more dense than water. And when you heat water, it turns into vapor and rises. Therefore, air is less dense than water. So you have earth, water, air, fire in terms of density, right? So you have a conjunction in the sign of water, but Mercury elemental year of air. And in fact, this is just a few years. This is just one Mercury elemental year cycle of the very next Mercury elemental year of air is when human beings realize the first powered and controlled flight, the Wright brothers. And it happened in the US of A, where a country was born with Saturn Uranus in trine. The trine is a, is a uh, friendly, productive, um, you know, harmonious aspect between compatible uh, positions, right? Saturn and Uranus, you know, like using, building upon previously established stuff, they used bicycle parts to create the first airplane, you see? Um, and so, so the 20th century, the advances that, that, it, that happened with respect to our relationship with air were so incredibly profound. I mean, in 1903, the first airplane takes flight and it was only 63 years later, uh, sorry, 66 years later, uh, 1969, that human beings landed on the moon. You know, so this is a profound um, sinking of the um, Saturn Uranus cycles with the Mercury elemental year of air. Um, in 1897, 1942, and 1988, the most recent, which was the most recent one, all three of these years are years where the Mercury. Mercury was spending more time in the air element than all the other elements. So there's this syncing up between Mercury and Saturn Uranus that is very noticeable in the developments of technology. Um, I mean, I could go into that more, but I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, if we step outside back into our normal timeline for a moment. 1897 was the year of the Klondike gold rush. Um, it was also the year that the Boston subway opened. So there's these, uh, there's these um, on the one hand, there's this sort of uh, flash in the pan, this sort of like, mm, this sort of, you know, most people didn't make any money off the Klondike gold rush, right? It was this phenomena that was, uh, you know, it, it felt like the future, but it really wasn't the future, but for just a very select few. Um, whereas subways very much did become the way of the future. Um, and then if we look forward to the third quarter square from this cycle, And I'm not going through the entire cycle because I would just be more than the time we have. We're at the third quarter square, so I'm focusing on that. Um, the, you see uh, what's really interesting here, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building were both taking shape at this time. So remember the last uh, waning square, the, the seed of the future, the first skyscraper was built. Now, oh, we're going to take, yeah, yeah, we're going to take that seed the next level, and we're gonna have these super skyscrapers, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building, which have now been eclipsed. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if the tallest building in the world is happening right now. And I mean, I don't even know, but I, I imagine that it is somewhere. Um, that's a kind of thing that seems to always be going on now, uh, which is interesting. Another thing that's interesting that happened at this time in 1930 was uh, the motion picture, blah, motion picture production code was implemented. So again, this rigid set of standards, Saturn, you know, having the dominance in this part of the cycle, you know, you can show this, you can't show that. And this was in effect 
for a very long time and it kind of um you know crystallized the way that that industry was um able to portray um you know the reality um was from a very rigid set of standards uh until really the 1960s 70s right So then we have the next conjunction of these two happens once again in uh, Taurus. Once again, we see this idea of inclusion versus exclusion. This was uh, 1942 was the year of, of where the um, Roosevelt made the decision for the internment of Japanese Americans. Um, which is very regrettable. Also the Manhattan Project decided to pursue the atomic bomb, which was eventually used. In my opinion, a regrettable decision once again. Um, if we look forward to the third quarter square from that development, um, and remember Uranus, um, Saturn, Uranus, and Taurus, 11th house, the, this idea of finances. Um, coming up again, if we go forward to the third quarter square from that cycle. That was in 1975 which is very interesting. Remember how we said that the um, motion, predict motion picture production code was put in place and kind of blew up at this time. Jaws became the first big modern blockbuster and Jaws broke with that tradition by being pretty violent, pretty um, scary and uh, in intentionally, you know, uh, scaring the shit out of people. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and the people loved it, you know, it was, it was uh, exhilarating. Um, and um, also SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States reinstates the death penalty at this point in time. It had been sort of a, on moratorium for a little while. Um, the Copyright Act of 1976 established the principle of fair use where it gave some exclusions to copyright. Um, so there was this balance between the rights of the copyright holder versus the public interest. That, and so and fair use is, you know, means that um, there are certain conditions where the, um, if it's for education, it's for, if it's for the good of public, um, and it doesn't hinder the um, profitability of the original copyright, then okay, you know, we're going to allow that under fair use essentially. So there's this interesting um, thing going on there. And then the next conjunction, which is the foundation for the cycle within which we reside now at this moment, the next conjunction happens in 1988, in late Sagittarius. And this is very interesting for a few reasons. Um, there's, there's one reason in particular that is, um, that is particularly poignant. Um, astronomically, when we look at this, Late Sagittarius A, it's right near the zero Capricorn point, so it's very, it's very much on that world axis of of the solstice point. But this is also a time when the galactic equator was already beginning to align with the solstice point. So Saturn Uranus was was in, involved in two major structures, of uh, one being the solstice. Um, axis, solstice equinox axis that forms the world axis. And, all, and the other being the galactic equator, which forms um, our, our um, relationship with 
our, you know, the, the next larger entity beyond our solar system. You know, so galactic center, right? And so there's this, in, there's this next step, you know, Uranus has always been about the future. Um, and, uh, and taking things the next step, but this is like a, a quantum leap or a, an exponential increase in the amount of next step and the amount of future that is available, you see, because this galactic dimension that comes in where the, the galactic equator is already beginning to align with the solstice point, which is the foundation of the whole 2012 phenomenon, right? It became exact in 2012, but you can see right there, it's already right going pretty much right through it, you know, and Saturn and Uranus are aligning with that. So there's this very big expansion. Sagittarius is about the future. Sagittarius is about the archer who aims his bow at the far horizon, right? So on several different levels, the, the nature of the archer is the future, you know, it's a mutable sign. It's about adjustments. It's about adjusting and making room for a new beginning. In the cardinal signs, um, you know, the the mundane axis, the beginning of a new season, um, the the and the galactic dimension takes that on a whole another level. And of course, at this time, this is when um, the first direct IP connection happened between Europe and, and North America. So uh, computers and, and internet um, technology was, was being advanced um, on a positive level and also on a negative level, the first computer worm, inter major internet virus happened in this year. The Dell computer company was incorporated there because of this IP connection between Europe and um, and North America, uh, the World Wide Web entered the conversation um, and, and would become a reality in the next few years. Um, and so there's this, there's this whole new world of possibilities that opens up at this point in time with this conjunction, even more so than, and remember, it's built on a foundation of a Mercury elemental year of air. So there's this air, there's this communications aspect of it that is very much um, part of the deal. And now we find ourselves at the third quarter square of this. And what, what one of the things that's coming into awareness is cryptocurrency, this whole new idea of how money can operate, of how money can um, be, you know, these, you know, these tokens. Um, and you know, it's, 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 it's nearing this um, threshold point of, right, this crisis of consciousness where if enough people become conscious of the possibilities inherent in this new technology, it could achieve what's called mass adoption and become, and become real, become a real possibility rather than a theoretical possibility. But that real versus theoretical is kind of hanging in the balance right now. We don't know because the, remember, the Saturn forces have the upper ground in the third quarter. And the Saturn forces, listen, the government has a monopoly on money. They're not just going to give that up without a fight. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, it's very much um, up in the air about how exactly we're going to um, go forward. And yet there's a tremendous sense of, so is this the Klondike gold rush? Is this something where, you know, yeah, a few people get rich, but most people, you know, get, go bust. Or is it more like um, one of these other things where we saw, you know, that, or it, well, is it like the whiskey rebellion where this, remember whiskey was essentially a diff, an alternative currency. And the government said, no, no, we are going to tax that. And, you know, and the people said, yeah, all right, you know, we're going to, we're going to back down. We're not going to go too far with our uh, rebelliousness. We're going to back down. We're going to accept your, we're not going to make it easy for you to collect those taxes, but we're not going to tar and feather folks. And we're not going to, um, you know, have a mass rebellion either. You know, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to see like exactly how this plays out. Um, 
and I got to tell you, I, I don't know, you know, I, you know, on the one hand, um, on the one hand, I can see, you know, very clearly when people talk about the, the, you know, the technology and the blockchain and all the possibilities that it opens up. Wow. I mean, it sounds incredible. Honestly, it's overwhelming to me. I mean, I'm Gen X, man. I didn't grow up with this crap. It's like, oh man, you know, it's another thing for me to another learning curve, another, you know, oh my God, more passwords. <laughs> <laughs> yeah am i at this point the 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 old oldster who's resisting a little bit to be honest with you yeah that's like man seriously uh can i hire somebody to manage all that part of it for me uh that would be great um but but at the same time i mean my god you know if if indeed this the freedom and the and the liberty and the the um innovation that could be possible because of this technology, if even a little bit of that it manages to be, you know, um, become reality, we've got to try, you know? So it's very interesting, um, you know, is this like when the Dow Jones Industrial Average first got published? Because that turned out to be a pretty big thing that is still to this day. Or is it like the Klondike Gold Rush? You know, we don't know yet. Um, and so that's the interesting thing about it. I have actually been, you know, through one of my members um, who, who, you know, decided, you know, hey, I'm going on the Klondike Gold Rush, man. You, you know, can you help me out here? And that's, yeah, okay. You know, and so we started looking at some of these charts of Bitcoin and whatnot. Bitcoin was founded under the Saturn Uranus opposition, of course. Um, and so now we're at the square. And so there's this next phase of development of like, is this thing going to make it past this first phase of development or is it going to get thwarted by the government? We don't quite know yet. Um, we're still trying to figure that out. Both, you know, seem to be, it's probably a little bit of both. I don't imagine the governments, I don't imagine you're going to be able to get away without paying taxes on it. I mean, that much I'm, I'm sure is going to happen. Um, how much that really the question is how much that government created currencies particularly with china but also the u.s government is wants to get in on the game and how much those are going to um kind of control the market we don't know um so this is a very interesting time with respect to um technology and and uh and the future and and where is it going um and, you know, so it's an interesting time in one way, and it's maybe it's a little bit scary to some people are just like, you know, ah, um, I don't know, and, and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to risk all my, you know, I'm certainly not going to put all my eggs in one basket, I'll tell you that much. Um, but yeah, like, um, I don't want to get left behind either, you know what I'm saying? So there's that tension of opposites. One thing that does strike me about this is that um, the previous conjunction was in a fire sign. And remember, fire is the least dense of all the elements, right? There's fire, then a little more dense is air, then a little more dense is earth. So some people are saying, look, man, this cryptocurrency is definitely the way of the future. Jupiter and Saturn were in earth signs. You know, you had hard currency like gold and silver that went to paper money and now paper's going to, you know, crypto. Like it's pretty obvious, get on the ship and, and you'll be glad you did, right? Okay, but on the other hand, like that conjunction was in fire. So, and the, you know, basically the argument is air is less dense than earth. And so, you know, you know, air, the air, Jupiter and Saturn are now in air. It's definitely, you know, currency is going that way. Get on board the ship and, and you'll be glad you did, you know, and then on the up, but then I go, you know, on the other hand, that conjunction was in fire, man. Fire is very not dense at all. It's very idealistic, Sagittarius. Like, is this, are we really ready for this? Is this going to achieve mass adoption just yet? 
or does it need the next conjunction happens, guess what, in an air sign in 2032? To me, that's the mass, mass adoption, um, where, yeah, by that time, like it's, it's definitely going to take hold. Um, you know, whether or not it takes hold in this cycle, I'm just not sure yet. Uh, it's an interesting conundrum. So yeah, I I um I gave some recommendations for some dates to for for this dude to uh, purchase some crypto and and he did and um, I was pretty I pretty much said you know I think this is going to be a low and it, and it was um, yeah a relative low anyways and um, in my latest uh, newsletter not newsletter uh, my latest monthly report that went out. I have a um, an election where I say, hey, you know, uh, Mercury is in its Guzahar or Jalzahir. It's crossing its north node and it's doing so in sextile to Uranus and said, hey, this might if you want to get in on the crypto game, this might be a good time to do that. Um, but again, you know, I think I would hedge my bets. I think I would have, you know, I would definitely not put all my eggs in the crypto basket and I would definitely not put all my eggs in any one of those baskets. Um, you know, so yeah, I think you have to kind of at this point, uh, do it that way. I don't, you know, it would be nice, you know, to be uber rich and be able to afford to throw a whole lot of money at it because, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you can afford the risk, why the hell not basically, you know, but, but that ain't me. I ain't never been rich. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, um, that's, that's the story for most of us, of course. But yeah, I think that, um, that, you know, not to be myopic about this, and see that's, there are many different ways that this is playing out, you know, with respect to our relationship with technology, you know. Um, for instance, look at the way of the future in terms of um, uh, work has been radically redefined at this point. The crisis of consciousness is, hey, making people show up at a corporate headquarters, you know, and do this commute, it's not worth it. So the workplace has been radically redefined through this pandemic, for sure. And the way of the future is very different going forward. And that's a good thing. Um, and so you know, even if you're not about this cryptocurrency thing, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like, you know, I can certainly understand that point of view, but there's still ways in which technology is redefining the future that it's good to get on board with. Um, and so trying to find where your comfort level with, okay, I can accept this much. And then, you know, try integrating that and then maybe a little bit more and so forth, you know wherever feels safe for you. Um, sometimes you have to push your comfort levels and do things that feel unsafe. But sometimes you really gotta listen to your gut and say, that does not feel safe. And I'm not going there, even if everybody else is, oh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, So it, it's, it's an interesting conundrum to be managing. Um, and uh, I can feel the tension here in my gut a little bit. <laughs> That's it's exciting and it's and it's uh, uh, it's worrisome at the same time. So yeah, there's an invitation here to contemplate um, where there might be some crystallized habits that need to um, be let go of, um, behavior patterns that need to be. Uh, you know, where the, the new, the new creative spirit needs to be allowed in, needs to be allowed a place at the table. Um, but there's also maybe a caution to not go too far with that and not over radicalize something to the point where you turn people off against it or you, um, or you destabilize and bring chaos into the situation, you know, going too far too fast. Um, yeah, so, you know, that finding that balance point 
And then and that's a totally individual, unique thing and really respecting and, and honoring that other people have come to that place for them as well. Um, that's kind of where we're at with this. So thanks again for tuning in. Um, I really appreciate y'all listening in. It's, it's been an amazing ride to be on this trip. Um, I, 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 you know, sometimes I, I wake up every day thinking, wow, I can't believe that I've created this life where I get to do what I do. It's pretty incredible. Um, and so thank you for listening in and supporting that. And thank you for all the reviews of the podcast and, um, reviews of my book and, um, uh, and the different ways that people support this venture going forward. Thanks for, you know, liking us on Facebook and all the different ways that, you know, and subscribing to my newsletter and all that. Um, with respect to, um, this idea of currency and whatnot. Looking forward to the future, the immediate future, as in the August um, edition of the podcast and the and the report. I've got I've gone the next level with these um, elections, where you know when you do, we talked about at the beginning when you do planetary elections, you you want a constellation of factors that include a planet in its dignity um, on an angle in its day and hour, if you can get it, you know, with the moon, with support from the moon and without any, you know, harsh aspects from other players, right? Um, and you get, then you get these, uh, the next step is like supporting that with house-based significations. So um, I've got two uh, wealth talismans that I'm going to be uh, making next month in August that, that are really like, wow. This is next level stuff. Not only are they planetary elections for wealth, so you've got the sun and mercury are both associated with wealth. So I've got two really good sun mercury elections. But then I started thinking about like um, this idea of the house significations backing that up. And I realized there's a um, passage in the Picatrix. Um, let's see, it is specifically, let's see if I can find it. It's uh, it's on, it's on my desk here somewhere. I think it's, it's uh, book one, chapter five. There's this series of recipes that are given. There's like 16 factors that says they're all house-based. Um, and I realized like, holy crap, these elections have most of those factors in there too. And so these are some really potent. Um, and so these could be uh, times to get in on the crypto market. They could be in times to get in on the standard you know, what people now are calling the legacy system of the, the, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Remember, it was founded during a waning or, or first published during a waning Saturn Uranus Square um, or other forms of wealth, you know, like, for instance, having a job that you love. That is a major source of wealth that I that I am happy to say that I have managed to find in my life. Um, and there are many other forms of wealth. And so, um, you know, I invite you to think about signing up for the membership program um, and, uh, and finding out about that. Um, all right. And so you can do that on the uh, membership page of the website, right? So there's a few different options. All right. So thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, bright blessings of Saturn as it moves uh, into opposition with the sun. Saturn and Jupiter are out in the early morning now, very bright. Um, and they're both moving towards their opposition with the sun, which happens in August. So they're becoming brighter and brighter and staying out longer and longer throughout the night. Um, and so bright blessings of Papa Saturn <laughs> until next time. <laughs>